Well, good evening. Uh, my name is Vince Nicastro, and I serve here as the Director of Athletics at Villanova. And I wanted to welcome everyone to this fifth annual Business of Sports Conference. And I've uh, had the pleasure of being a small part of, I think, all of the other uh, conferences we've had here. And, and tonight's is very special, as, uh, as you'll see. Um, tonight's subject uh, about uh, lockouts and the economic impact of lockouts is one that's very timely. As, as you know, there were a couple back uh, recently in the fall. Uh, and, and being related not only, you think of it being related to players at the professional level, but as we've seen, uh, as this thing has evolved, officials and umpires and others associated with the games uh, being involved in those types of, of work stoppages as well. So it's, again, very timely. Uh, I did promise that at some point we will have uh, a session on conference realignment. And uh, I mentioned earlier, it's been a, a topic of conversation in the world of intercollegiate athletics for a number of years now, and, uh, and we certainly have our, our direction here at Villanova, but I'm still under a gag order. So this, I think the original topic was going to be something about conference realignment, but we'll have to defer that till hopefully this time next year, and I'll be able to share every story that I have. Um, just as a, a, a sort of teeing this up for you, as, as students that may want to be involved in this business uh, in some form or fashion, this is a tremendous and unique opportunity that you have tonight. Uh, the panelists and presenters tonight are literally world class. Uh, this just doesn't happen at a lot of places where you have the individuals, again, who are here tonight as panelists or presenters coming to share their expertise and their knowledge and their, their hands-on uh, experience and insights in this world of, uh, of professional and, and other sports for this topic of, of lockouts and, and other issues related to, to labor. So I encourage you to take full advantage of that. Uh, there would be plenty of folks that I know who literally work in the business at the professional and inter intercollegiate level that would pay lots of money to come and hear what these folks have to offer. So uh, take advantage of the opportunity, ask questions, interact. I think uh, that's what they're here for and they're happy to share all of their insights. With that, I'd like to turn it over to someone who's a little better at this than I am as our moderator tonight, uh, Michael Bradley, who has uh, uh, been a longtime friend and uh, been a, a great writer, a great journalist, but also now I like to call him uh, Professor Bradley, who uh, happens to be an adjunct professor here. Some of you may be in his, uh, taking his class. Um, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Michael, who will uh, MC uh, tonight's session. Thank you. Thank you, Vince. I, I've been trying to get those stories out of Vince uh, for the last few years about a conference realignment to no avail, so he truly is under a gag order. Uh, I am Michael Bradley. Uh, as Vince said, I am a professor here at Villanova. I teach uh, the future of sports journalism in the communications department. I also teach at St. Joe's and Newman Universities. Uh, I'm a writer. I contribute to Philadelphia Magazine. I write for Athlon Sports and a variety of other publications, regional and national, and you can hear me on 97.5 The Fanatic as well and every now and then they let me on Comcast Sportsnet. Before I get started, I wanted to uh, introduce the, the members of the panel who will be giving you the real insight tonight. I'm sort of a facilitator. I'll ask some questions, and they're going to have the real information. Uh, so rather than my tell you about them, I'll let them tell you a little about them beginning at my left here. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is John Reinhardt, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer for the Sacramento Kings. And Vince is my new agent, going to try to find me those people that will come and pay to hear me speak, because I have not found them yet. Um, the, uh, my job at the Kings is really uh, center-focused around the business. Um, so you can look at, there's the basketball side, which runs the team, and the, the talent scouts, the coaches, the GMs. And then there's the business side that you know, takes care of the fans, gets people in the seats, gets everything kind of uh, rolling, revenue generation, expense management, and all that kind of um, graduated from Villanova in 1991, um, so I'm also glad that Vince is in a gag order because it gave us a chance to talk about this pot, uh, this topic and get me back to campus. Always good to be back here. Um, appreciate all you guys coming out, and hopefully we can uh, help give you some insight that I need. Hi, hopefully you guys can hear me. Uh, my name is Ed Wazlewski. I am an NFL agent, attorney, and a founding partner with Ultimate Sports Agency based here in Philadelphia area. 
graduated uh, from Villanova here in 95 and have worked in uh, pro sports on the team side with the Caps and Wizards, uh, the Eagles Radio Network. Went to law school about 10 years ago, graduated and uh, became a licensed NFL agent. Um, you know, today is a good opportunity. You have a great panel here and uh, look forward to answering some questions you may have and uh, hopefully you can uh, take advantage of that today. And this is a, a good opportunity when you're in college to learn a lot about the business of sports and take advantage of it, work for free and do internships. So hopefully we can uh, assist you with that tonight. How you guys doing? Uh, Sean Tilger, Senior Vice President of Business Operations for the Flyers. Uh, first off, thanks for uh, having us again tonight, like the other gentlemen have said. It really shows a lot of initiative by you guys to come out on a, a weeknight like this to be here. Um, my role is, is similar to Michael's, where uh, I basically oversee the business operations and day-to-day -day business for the team. Uh, Paul Holmgren oversees the hockey side, and I oversee the business side. So all the P&L uh, related issues, broadcast, sponsorship sales, ticket sales, finance, ticket operations, uh, service, publicity, um, game presentation, community relations, all that fun stuff. Uh, and most importantly, it's entertaining the fans and getting them in the building. Okay, why don't we get it started? Uh, we always hear both from the player side and the team side a lot that professional sports is a business. And in the last 18 months, we really learned about that because for three of the major four sports, the headlines were about collective bargaining agreements, uh, percentages of revenues. We really learned about the business because you can't have a sport in the professional ranks anymore unless you have an agreement between the ownership and the players on how things are going to be div divided up, how contracts are going to be done, et cetera. And I'd like to start with sort of a, a general question to the panel. Uh, we hear all the time about the, the term, it's a business. And how do teams kind of justify that when, you know, we're playing games, we have competition, it's, it's fun, you want the people to be entertained. It's sort of a, a fine line to walk. I'll start, Sean, if you don't mind, uh, starting off down there. It's, it's a fine line to walk a little bit, and, and how do you kind of come to grips with both sides? Well, uh, first and foremost, I think it's important for us to realize that uh, the thing that's created the, the fan avidity to, the, to the, all of our sports is the sport itself and not the business side. And during times of, uh, excuse me, during work stoppages and um, uh, labor disputes, what I found that nobody wins. It's, it's bad for everyone. Uh, the best part about this negotiation that just ended is the fact that we got eight years of um, labor peace with another two, option for another two. Uh, when dealing with the fans, uh, a lot of it revolved around taking the fan perspective and realizing that they didn't want to hear about our business issues. They, it's, to them, it almost sounded like whining. Um, they were more interested in when are you going to play and what's going on. Uh, so we kind of let that this is <coughs> that we knew they were going to be angry. And we weren't going to try to uh, hide from that fact. So we just tried to keep them engaged and as informed as possible. Uh, within the guidelines that the leagues put out because we're kind of not gag orders, but there are restrictions of things we can and can't say. John? Yeah, uh, very similar to Sean. I mean, the fact that, you know, it is a business and you never want to shut down your business and effectively when you have a lockout, that's what you're doing. Not only are you taking away the entertainment and really the emotional connection that you've built up with the fan base because for them, it's not a business. For them, it's a relationship that they've spent a lot of time they spent a lot of money, they spent a lot of personal kind of uh, affinity to, and you've kind of taken that away. And it's hard because from a fan's perspective, they look at it like, you know, you guys are generating billions of dollars. How can you not figure out how to divide that up? You know, you're, you're raising my season ticket prices, you're raising food and beverage prices, parking, everything, and you can't figure out how to divide that up. It just doesn't make sense to the general fan. So, it is a fine line when you're when you're making that decision to you know have a lockout or a work stoppage, um, because you are shutting down your business and you you don't know if when you reopen the doors, like if you were selling clothing at a mall, if you reopen the doors, are people going to come back in and buy your product? And you know that's the fine line that you you face. Now, Ed, you look at it from a different standpoint, being working with the players. A lot of times, the players are looked at as villains as well, 
how do you justify it on, on their side? They're trying to get a good deal for themselves as well. Well, um, does most, um, most of the folks out here know the difference between a strike and a lockout? So when there's you a lockout. You can lock tell he's an agent already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he has it. He's going on record. I think they got you're, me in the middle for a reason. You're sitting in between two team reps here, man. Be careful. <laughs> Bang on the right. Um, players are locked out. It just, um, you know, I've worked on the team side before. As a matter of fact, uh, when I was uh, about your age, I worked for Paul Holmgren as an intern with the Hartford Whalers. You guys probably don't even remember the Hartford Whalers. But, um, but I've worked on the team side, and a lockout from a player's perspective is just that. We, we, we as the, the, the workers want to go. We want to perform. Uh, we, we have a contract. We're ready to honor it. And uh, we come up to work, and the doors are locked. So uh, probably 95% of the players um, are not really affected by a lockout in, in, in the sense that um, they're, you know, especially in football, their contracts aren't guaranteed. They have short lifespans. So um, for us, it's just really a hierarchy with the, the, the Tom Brady's and the Peyton Manning's of the world that are fighting for the big $100 million contracts and those extra two or three percentage points or five or ten percent mean a lot, but then for most players, it doesn't really mean much. Okay, why don't we look into some of the specifics of it. And Sean, you mentioned fan engagement during, during a work stoppage. And, you know, you're trying to keep a team relevant when there are no games. You're trying to keep season ticket holders and suite holders to the point where they want to still buy the tickets when things come back. How do, you, how do you work to try to keep those relationships, as you said, when you're closed for business? For us, the business, if it's as we're playing, if it's in the off season, if it's, if it's in a work stoppage, the goals are always the same, and they revolve around the customer. Uh, so it's we always look at it as a position of, of a cycle that's constant acquisition, cultivation, and retention. And obviously, during some sort of labor um, stoppage or work stoppage, we want to call it, the uh, cultivation and retention are, the, are where we switch, switch our main focuses. Having said that, um, we're always trying to increase consumer uh, consumption of our product, which is, when I mean that, or grow their their participation. And you can either do that by increasing the number of games they attend, which during lockout doesn't is not an option. Uh, increasing uh, television ratings, which necessarily isn't an option, but we do do specialty programming. We rent, we work with our par TV partners, Comcast Sportsnet, NBC Sports and NBC to run classics and other replays and different featured programs. Our, our radio partner uh, this year is Michael's home station, uh, the Fanatic, um, where, and uh, WMR, uh, great partners, and we did a lot of promotions and things with them in terms of keeping us relevant. Um, they had the ability to talk to players, whereas we did not, so the players got on once in a while. But from a business perspective, we went on and said what we could. Uh, and this is where now to where we focused mostly during the lockout was increasing uh, the community relations and the playing of the sport or the participation in the sport. Uh, with that, we have the flyer skate zones and other areas. There's, I think, 85 rinks in the market. So we did a lot of grassroots efforts where we spent a lot of time creating programs that get kids the ability to play, the equipment to play. Ed Snyder has Ed Snyder Youth Hockey Foundation which um, has been a tremendous asset to the community. Uh, we have Flyers Charities. It was a lot of giving back and doing things to get out in the community with a positive light during a time when there wasn't a lot of positive things to say about the business. And then, uh, then there's always things you can do with your box retailers and your sponsors to still engage the customers. Um, it's, it's funny, because while you were talking, I was thinking about it. During a lockout, it's really tough for us because our players are still our product. <clears throat> so when you, it sounds like there's bad blood, we need to deflect that as much as possible because we love our players. Without, their play, without our players, there's no flyers. So it's ne we've never taken the approach to draw a line on the business side, and it's more about the logo and the brand and what the flyers are as a whole. Um, then on the retention side, it's just constant engagement and communication to our season ticket holders. Very aggressive plans that give them value and a assets and benefits that make sense for them because of the financial and emotional investment they make in the team. 
for example uh, if they committed to us and stayed with us we gave them a two percent um, uh, interest on their tickets but we, and we didn't charge them during the lockout we just tried to find as many customer and fan friendly ways as po ways possible to keep the fans feeling good about the Flyers organization now, I don't mean to say that we're hiding behind the NHL shield but we, we took the approach of how do we locally change the perception of views of, what, of, what's going, of what's going on. Fortunately for us, since we've been back, we, we're sold out the rest of the season. TV ratings are up 13%. Radio ratings are higher than they've ever been. Uh, sponsorship's up. Um, and it's all a reflection on the fans and the, how loyal the fan base is in Philadelphia. John, you want to add something? Yeah, I wish my business was doing as well as, <laughs> as John's, but we'll get there. Um, yeah, it really, just the only thing I'd add is, as, as you were saying, was really knowing that the connection for the fans is the team. And unfortunately, during a lockout, you've, you lose that major asset to help connect you because you can't use your current players. You can't have any marketing or any events with your current players. You really um, you know, lose all of that. So what we really tried to focus on is the legends. You, know, you could bring back old players because they're no longer covered under that collective bargaining agreement. So we really focus on bringing back legends like the you know, the Chris Webbers of the world, um, Mitch Richmonds of the world, the people that, although it's not the current roster, our, our fans could still connect and have events with them that we would have otherwise done with our current players. Um, and in doing that, you know, we stayed engaged. And then the second thing, outside of the actual the ticket buyer, is you have to stay engaged with your sponsors. You know, the, one of the largest chunks of your revenue streams outside of tickets is coming from your media and your sponsor advertising. So you can't forget about your sponsors. So we had to try to find ways to give our sponsors assets that they otherwise would have gotten during games so we could keep their money. Because what we didn't want to do is have to refund them their money. Um, so we actually did something where we partnered with the U.S. Ski and Snowboard Association. They were looking for somebody to sell their sponsor ads. And we had you know sponsorship salespeople that weren't doing a lot. Um, so we actually bought that event from them at Mammoth Mountain. And we were able to kind of move our sponsors who, who, like the Pepsis of the world, who like action sports, instead of spending money on us you know, at the basketball level, we put them into the, the snowboard event, the US ski and snowboard event. Um, so we were able to keep that money, keep them engaged. We still had our team branding. Um, so you know, we tried to stay relevant with our sponsors that way. OK, the next question I want everybody to answer, and I'll start with you, John, and then go to Ed. A lot of people, when they hear lockouts, don't understand everything that goes into a labor contract and everything that has to be hammered out so that the doors can open up so that both sides will understand all of the rules. Can you give us a little primer on, from your opinion, point of view of why the lockouts are, I don't want to say necessary, but why they happen and what goes into a labor contract? Yeah, I think you know, the, the reason in my mind that they're necessary is really when you take a look at your business and you realize that the economic model is turned upside down, meaning you're able to generate you know, a significant amount of revenue, and you're kind of meeting those targets. But even with those revenue streams, you're not able to control your costs. And from a lockout standpoint, you're really talking about your largest expense, which is your players. They're your largest asset, but they're also your largest expense. And if you can't get that cost under control, then you're going to have a hard time making money, regardless of how much revenue you're, you're generating. And it's, 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 even if you're at a box retailer store, They've got revenue, and they also have expenses that they have to manage and keep under control. So, you know, from our standpoint, on the team side and the league side, you know, it's necessary because your economic model and your expense model has started to outpace your revenue model. Now, Ed, you can look at it from another perspective of the players. Why, why do they happen, and, and what are the players trying to accomplish in, the, in this situation? Yeah, I think what um, I think you're, you know, exactly right. A lot of times. Uh, because these agreements are typically um, anywhere from seven to ten years, um, there it almost covers a, an error within the sport. So th there, there's a resetting of what market value really is, and um, it's just like negotiating anything. And from my perspective, from the player side, football is much different than the other sports in the fact that there's no guaranteed contracts. Everything you get in in football, you have to get either as a rookie when you enter the league or after three or four years of service. So, um, you know, with football, just more specifically, you're looking at the NFL draft versus free agency. And it's really, on the player side, uh, 
it's controlled by the, the union reps, and the union reps are all the veterans. They don't ask seniors, you know, I'm going to the combine tomorrow. They're not going to ask uh, Matt Barkley from USC if he can be involved in a contract in a labor negotiation. Um, so what you're doing is they're real, they're, the, on the player side, you're trying to get as much money for the current players. And um, it's, it's, it's much different, you know, you're, because um, you, look, you look at two or three years ago, Sam Bradford, a franchise quarterback number one overall, might have got $60 million in, in guarantees, and now, you know, Andrew Luck getting, a, you know, a fraction of that, still well, um, a, a thick contract, but what we're looking at here on, on a football side and from the, the, the player side is you're trying to create as much leverage as you can, and if the players don't show up to play, you don't have a product. So at the end of the day, uh, football, we knew that the lockout was going to end by the time training camps started because the owners weren't going to miss one whole year of revenue. No matter what they were positioning themselves as, um, they needed the players and they needed the product, they needed the fans to come out and buy tickets and, and, and sponsorship from the company. So um, I think, you know, from the player side, it's just about resetting your market and trying to see, you know, how the owners have generated more revenue and how you can increase your piece of the pie. Unfortunately, in football, you have a cap. So like other sports, it kind of limits how much, you know, it's true. Agents' jobs are to be greedy, but that starts with the players. I have never met a player that said, you know what, Ed, um, the team is really paying me too much. You know, it's, why don't you give back $20,000, $30,000? The only way a player gives back money is when he's fined by a team. And that happens. And they have the ability to grab into my client's wallet. But, um, you know, this is America. And, you know, uh, the owners are sometimes painted in a difficult light as the villains. And the players are, can be humanized. And we have Twitter and social media, and we can connect with the fans during the lockout. So we can do fun stuff and community events, and, and we look kind of like the good guys. But in reality, it's just a resetting the market on both sides. Sean, Ed used the term about the contracts actually being like an era. And the NHL has seen that over the past 15 years. A couple of eras have come and gone. How, how do you look at that from the, the NHL standpoint about you know how the lockouts happen and what's involved in getting the agreement? Well, let me start by saying, I've been with the organization for 16 years, which means I've been through three of these. <laughs> so I have experience I, no one wants. Um, in terms of, uh, I'll get to the contracts piece in a point, uh, uh, answer in a second, but I don't envy uh, the, the union re re rep or the uh, commissioner tasks when it comes to this negotiation because you have to find the perfect mix that makes. 30 owners, uh, uh, happy, 700 players, and millions of fans. Because it really has to be a, uh, something that works for all three pieces. Because if the business the expenses get out too far out of hand, it turns around and causes the need to increase ticket prices. Because uh, so, you can only sell so much television spots. You can only sell so much, so many tickets at so many prices. So it, it, the, the impact to the fan in this is, I don't know, is kind of something that needs to be absorbed but we don't want to talk too much about because the worse the deal <laughs> on either side, it, it impacts the fans directly because of the cost to run the business. But having said that, um, deals as a whole, to, to your original question, uh, we didn't have a cap, now we have a cap. Uh, we do have guaranteed contracts. Uh, we do also have revenue sharing. Uh, and, and these are all very complicated issues that go into uh, figuring out this, these negotiations. So it's not as simple as saying, because everyone heard 50-50 split and thought that was all there was to it. Well, the thing is you gotta figure out what's 50% 50, 50 of what, and how, and then there's auditors and everything else to determine what hockey related revenues are. That's everything from the buildings, uh, revenues that come in w w while the events are going on and, and the whole litany, it depends on if the team owns the, t the building or the team doesn't own the building. It's, it's and talking about a lot of terms here, but it, it's so different for each club, and I'm sure everyone up here would agree, that uh, I think it's really an unenvious job to be in the center of that, um, because there's a lot of strong personalities on both sides of that. 
Now, <clears throat> we've heard the teams and how they kind of adapt and try to keep their, their doors open, as it were, during a lockout. Ed, tell me a little bit about how you would advise some players in advance of a lockout when you, you know a contract's coming up, you know it's going to be an acrimonious set of, of negotiations. How do you get these guys prepared for this financially, medically, et cetera? Yeah, I think the, uh, the NFL Players Association did a great job really prepping the agents, kind of scaring us that the gloom and doom of the NFL lockout is going to last two years, you know, a year and a half. Um, I've been doing this 10 years, and I didn't think it would last past one year, but they really built it up because a lot of times, uh, you know, players, uh, they feel that the next contract is right around the corner. They're going to get paid. They have, why wouldn't they, you know, why you know, why would there be a, a lost season? Well, other sports we've seen, there's been lost seasons. Um, and uh, to the detriment of the sport, what, I've, what I did with my clients and uh, had anywhere from 10 to 15 guys, that's generally my practice, um, I, I really have to get, it's, it's a hands-on, you know, talking to them about budgeting their money. Because you get a football player, you just got off, came off of a season, you get paid for four or five months, depending on if you're in the playoffs. and. Now you have to make it last nine months until the next September. Well, if there's a lockout that extends for a year, now you're looking at pretty much two years. Um, you know, when you get young players that are rookies making $405,000 after taxes, that's you know that's a big bite right there. Maybe you're at 255, 270, and then you agents have to, fees. Agents fees only three <laughs> percent. That should probably be higher. Um, it used to be about five percent or four percent when Jerry Maguire was. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> around, so I'm not being too biased here. Um, but uh, yeah, there's, there's expenses, and then what happens is, what I see, it's, which is much different than when I was on the team side, is that on the team side, you don't get to see what the, the, the stress is on the, de on the player on a daily basis. The player is often viewed as the breadwinner, even though he's 22, for the whole family. And that family may extend to 10 uncles and aunts, on, you know, five on each side, you have grandparents, Divorce, you have three, four sets of parents. You, got, you might have uh, little brothers and sisters you have to take care of. So now you have a, you're not going to get paid or the threat of not getting paid. So my job is to tell a player that he's got to talk to the 15 or 20 people on his family that instead of getting their normal checks, they have to cut that in half or even l less than that. And um, also from a medical perspective, you have limited options. Some players are coming off surgeries. You have to get all this done before this lockout um, starts. And it was, it was a real big threat and uh, you know it affected the way a lot of, a lot of folks did business. For, for that year I really only signed one college player. I normally signed five or six because I didn't know if I was going to be training a player realistically for 16 months. And nobody wants to put a, you know, uh, right now you train a player for two months, he goes to the combine and great, now he's on, you know, he's on his own and uh, he gets drafted a month later. If you're training a player, uh, no offense, but the happiest day of your parents' life is when you guys graduate, you know, and you're uh, you're done, and you're off of their uh, their their um, their credit card and their expense account. So, the biggest thing as an agent, we had to monitor their 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 financial side. Now, um, I wanted to ask John. Sacramento is not what one would consider a large market. How does a lockout impact a, a smaller market team versus a larger market team? Yeah, I think the, there, there's definitely a, a dichotomy between the larger market teams and the smaller market teams. And, and really, it, it goes with what are people's goals. You know, a larger market team has a lot more to lose during a lockout than a smaller market team because their revenues are bigger. Um, you know, some of the smaller market teams, like in Sacramento, we actually benefited from the lockout, like from having a shortened season, you know, it almost, it helped us, you know, not, losing a whole season is never a good thing for anybody. That, that would, would not be beneficial for large or small. Um, but, it, you know, the, the economics were so upside down that it was necessary and it was actually beneficial for us to, to miss some games in order to make sure that the economics got right-sided. Um, in order for us to compete with the larger markets. And, you know, it came along with not only the collective bargaining agreement, but the revenue sharing agreement between the larger markets and the smaller market teams um, that came. So, the, you know, the, the real, you think it's a negotiation between the Players Association and the league and the teams, but there's also a side negotiation going on between the large market teams and the smaller market teams that you, you really had to manage. Sean, we're here in the 
to Philadelphia, which is considered a large market. Uh, and how did it, is there, uh, is there a difference in the way things were done in, uh, say, Philadelphia than Winnipeg, Winnipeg during the, uh, the lockout? The issue that's a little different, but it's the same, is in the negotiation, the impacts of revenue sharing, uh, where, where you have the higher revenue earning teams and you end up sharing revenue with lower earning teams, is a very sensitive topic, but all of it is done to, to create a competitive balance and maintain a healthy 30-team league. Uh, so for, for us, we had the luxury of owning several different companies and properties. I don't know how familiar everyone is with Comcast Spectacor, but um, we, we were able to, to keep other revenues going by moving staff around to help, like we moved the sales staff to sell concerts and family shows in the wings, and um, I worked on our global spectrum side with our facility management side while doing the, doing the day-to-day stuff with the flyers, and we, we didn't have to lay anybody off, and that's a credit to Ed Snyder and Peter Luco. Um, so as a large market team, there are you have the more flexibility, I would say, um, during a, a lockout to if you, based on how much real estate you have, for, for lack of a better word. Uh, but it, you definitely, the losses pile up faster. I mean, when you're losing big gates and whatnot. Uh, but again, the players, you know, they're not getting paid unless they chose to go play somewhere else. So it's not, I mean, it's, it's <coughs> my original point where nobody wins. Ed, speaking of the players, you mentioned about training them even if they're not rookies or they're coming in, how do you keep them in shape? They don't have access anymore to the, the tremendous facilities that are uh, available to them from the teams. They don't have the training staff, the medical staff. And obviously the NFL lockout didn't last years, but heading into training camp, you didn't have OTAs, you didn't have uh, mini camps, and you didn't have the opportunity to go into the, to the program, uh, to the uh, facilities. How did, how did you keep them in shape so that when they came back, they weren't gonna get injured? And I think the reality is that um, for football players, it was a little bit the wild, like the wild, wild west. You had uh, players doing things on their own. Some players, uh, you know, we tried, for our players, we tried to keep them in a, as much of a schedule as possible. And I told all my players on a regular basis, this thing's going to start. And that was the big message. No matter, and you have to be optimistic. There's going to be a lot of negative people in the room. There's always going to be negative people. And you have to be optimistic to get a deal done. And I think, you know, agents get a bad rap, but we're really an optimistic group that, is trying to make you know everyone money, you know. So it's uh, and you'd be surprised. Everyone has agents. They just call them something different. And um, for our for our point with with the training, we had to get our guys uh, make sure that they're working out local facilities. But you see, it's a, it's a niche industry now. You have Velocity Sports Performance. You have IMG API, and these guys, uh, you know, they trained as if they were going, you know, with their friends. And they were they were going to these mini camps, these training camps. But the funny part about that is because there wasn't the typical NFL offseason, which included May and, and, and OTAs, or organized team activities, and a full training camp, pretty much all these rosters, even though they had the, 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 mini camp, the, the training camp and a shortened uh, process, I think these rosters were set before even training camp started. So the guys that really lost out were might have been the, the, the long shots, the, the late round picks, the undrafted players whole wave of players, if you knew someone that, that came out of college in 2011 and tried to compete for a job in the NFL draft, they, they pretty much uh, they had an uphill battle because those veterans that were tied into the roster, they, were gonna, they knew those guys would play themselves in the shape. So our job, it, it's difficult, but um, you know, we allocate some of our resources and made sure our guys were training. John, Sean mentioned about <clears throat> how some of the players, some of the uh, staff within the Flyers were reassigned throughout Comcast Spectacor's various properties. How, how did, what was the impact on the lockout on the staff of Sacramento? And, and also, how do you keep morale up? Because the reports can get pretty grim. There's not going to be a season, or we're going to have a very short season. How do you keep people wanting still to come to work and give their all, and, and how do you keep them working? From, from a staffing standpoint, you know, again, being in a small market, our budgets were pretty tight and our margins are pretty tight. So we really did have to take a look at um, you know, our costs and our expenses and our staffing sizes. And, you know, we did have some layoffs around the lockout um, and, and really some position eliminations. So we tried to do it as much as if people were leaving voluntarily, we wouldn't replace their position, you know, versus actually having to let somebody go. So we kind of tried to do, you know, subtraction by attrition. 
and just you know have other people pick up those duties um, in order to to get through the lockout with the the assumption that once the lockout was lifted we we could staff back up but then the other thing we wanted to make sure is that we we didn't know when the lockout was going to end and you know we like I said we, you need to be optimistic you want to say okay this could happen tomorrow so you have to be ready to turn the switch you know instantly so you can't really cut back too much of your staffing and you do try to find other things for them to do um, for us we you know we run our building as well so we had all the concerts and family shows where we could reassign you know some people but keeping them motivated was a hard part especially if you're a salesperson who's used to selling a lot of tickets to the games and you know having you know let's say half of your income is generated by commissions and bonuses um, you know what we tried to do was we actually gave some guaranteed bonuses or commissions to sales staff even though they weren't selling you know because we didn't want them to have to take a pay cut to where they couldn't support the current lifestyle that they were living and then go look somewhere else for another job because we knew you know especially our top salespeople, we knew once we had to turn the switch and the lockout was lifted we'd only have about a week to ten days to get things going so we actually paid people for work that they weren't doing to keep them motivated because again from a sales standpoint money motivates people and so we focused on that and then we tried to do a lot of team building stuff. You know, we didn't have as many games, obviously, but we tried to do things together as a team because, like you said, things got grim. So we we did stuff like you know the you know, Maloof Olympics, where we had a week long thing where at lunchtime we had all these Olympic events that we all participated in, had a big gold trophy, you know, for the winners. Just keep people going, um, you know, excited to come back to work until you know things got better. Sean, can you amplify a little bit about, especially about the communications? Obviously, you can't be saying, well, here's how negotiations are going and here's what's really happening, but you still want to give the people some kind of communication from the top down so that they feel that they're involved in a, not just walking around in the dark. Yeah, just, just like we try to do with our fans and our corporate partners, we had to do the same thing with the staff. Uh, and as John mentioned, it's, it's, it's in a constant ready-to-go phase where, you know, you have to – Continually reshuffle the deck, rebudget, change your invoicing, change your incentive plans, change your communication timelines, and it's over and over and over. Uh, the, I think the overriding phrase we used was focus on controlling the controllables. Because um, it wasn't any of their fault, the business op business staff, of why this was going on. So making sure they knew they were performing well, and, then, and again, we didn't have to leave it off, so security was there, and that made people feel, feel really good. Uh, but we eliminated as many distractions as possible. I was literally telling staff, don't go on social media. Don't read it. I mean, because social media is like, it is truly the Wild West, because it's so unfiltered, and anybody can say anything. Um, and, I, and we kind of made sure, within the cone of silence, to speak openly and honestly to, to the staff. Um, and continual customer engagement. So we gave them, we did incentive programs based on the retention at the end of a lockout is a way to motivate them to, to keep doing the right things during the process. And making sure we found ways to keep them staying hungry by giving them goals that didn't necessarily tie our traditional metrics of sales volume. Uh, you mentioned controlling the controllables, and one of the things that the teams, the players can't control are the true defenders of truth and justice in the sports world, and that's the media, the real good guys in all of this. I say that because I'm part of the media. Thank you. And I want to start with you. How much of those, does a lockout from the player standpoint become more difficult because the media is out there looking for every single story, every single kernel, and sometimes they're reporting things that just aren't true by accident? Well, I think, um, you know, I was talking to a, a reporter friend of mine and years ago, and he always said that, uh, you know, the smartest folks in the business actually, you know, use the media to get across their talking points. So, um, and sometimes media are aware of that, sometimes they're not. But um, I'm sure the hires up in the NFL, whether they're uh, owners or GMs or, you know, from the commissioner's office as well as from, you know, the unions, um, they're using the media to get across their points and they're, they think they're manipulating it, but they're also, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're keeping their most important topics out there. 
and it's all a negotiation. So a lot of this stuff is played out in the public, and I think that's very important. With the NFLPA lockout, it became a public battle. It was almost Goodell against D. Smith, and you expected to see him in a in a hallway duking it out. And um, that was the perception that 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 I think D. Smith wanted to create that he was a, a litigator from a D.C. law firm, and he, I'm hired here to go the whole way. I'm going to keep our guys out until we get a deal we need. And the, the, you know, the media kind of built into that image who he was, and, um, and, and, and they roughed up the commissioner's office a little bit about um, whether it was concussion issues or other issues, player safety, and I think it kind of won the sympathy over the fans a little bit. Um, and you know, it, it, the media is, was very powerful. It's a negotiating tool, I think, it, you know, for both sides. Yeah, it was, it, you heard the, the term, the, uh, the millionaires against the billionaires. So you, know, you want to root for the millionaires because they're the little guys. In, in this, and it, and it happened. John, d did you think, did you see a similar thing? I mean, there was a gag order, obviously, and Sean was talking about that earlier, but there were still ways to kind of use the media and then have to deal with the way the media was reporting it. Yeah, it's very, very similar on the team side, especially the local media, um, because the national media was really focused at the league level and the players association level, but the local media was all over the local team, so like us. Uh, so, you know, again, we, we could fall back on, well, we're, we've got a gag order, we can't talk about that. And they would take that to, okay, well, here's what I'm going to write then. And they would write their perception of what it was because they passed somebody in the hallway that said that's what it was. And really, I, you know, it depends which part of the media you're talking to, but a lot of times, you know, I think a lot of it was a fishing exposition where they would say, here's what I'm going to write, hoping that you would either dispute that or confirm that by you know, one way or the other and then kind of run with it that way. So it, it, we had to be really careful on who we talked to and, and really it was answering the questions from the fans because all they heard was from the media because we weren't allowed to tell them anything. So you're kind of handcuffed because the fans are going to believe what the media is saying. It's like, oh, you guys should just let them come back and play. You're making enough money. You know, this – we heard that you made this much money last year as a league. Why can't that work? And we couldn't really dispute it and argue on our side. So, you know, as anybody, the, the general public is going to believe what they read. And with social media, like Sean said, they could read a lot of different things that are unfiltered. Um, so we had to try to combat that by really staying focused with our fans and our sponsors and our media, TV media partners and at least engaging them in what we could tell them and, and kind of keeping it that way. Sean, Comcast was in an interesting situation because they're not only a, a hockey uh, uh, owner, they're a media company, they have a lot of different arms. Was that to the benefit of the, of the Flyers or was it sort of, you know, you were thrown into the same kind of media uh, conundrum that a lot of other teams were? Well, we were in the same conundrum that everyone else was in because we couldn't say certain things. And media are extensions of our marketing key for us is to give them the tools to help them do their jobs and make sure that when they have things that they're going to go out there with that we can talk about, that we speak openly and honestly. Uh, but again, th there, are, there were restrictions put on us, which I can understand why the league has to do that. Uh, so we tried to more focus on what we were doing on the business side um, to, so we, that we could answer truthfully. Because we had tons of questions. I, I mean, my phone was ringing off the hook about how many season ticket holders did you lose this week? How many, how many sponsors did you lose this week? And fortunately for us, it was a good story, so I made sure to comment on it. I mean, we lost less than 1% of our season ticket holders. Um, but I, at the same token, I couldn't say anything about the negotiations. All I could speak about was the immediate business. Now, in regard to <coughs> excuse me, NBC and Comcast as a media company, since they're co-owners of the team, and NBC's also lost all the games they were broadcasting at that time. It wasn't good for anybody. And it, you know, the TV negotiation for the, the the rights deal extension was going on while this was all happening. So it was really interesting. Um, but it, again, it's just a we could it was we were very limited in what we could do differently with any of our internal media than we could with the public, just because the same rules. I want to ask Ed one more question, then we'll open it up to the, the students. The corporate sponsorship part, John and, and Sean both talked about how they tried to engage the, the corporate sponsors. Did you find from the player standpoint that they had to stay relevant and keep their names out there as, you know, in terms of 
uh, promotions and advertisements because they weren't playing, they weren't in the headlines, they weren't making news. Yeah, I think there's, a, you know, on a smaller scale with some of the guys, like, um, you know, they're, they're, nobody wanted to bring a football player in to do a signing, you know, on, on a smaller scale, whether it was a, um, a Staples or Papa John's. I mean, they didn't, they, it, was, uh, it was dead at that time. And, um, you know, the bigger companies like McDermott and McFadden had a very lucrative deal with Nike. Nike's not dropping him. They know the deal's going to be over with, uh, the, the lockout. So I don't think it really impacted it too much. I think the, the, on that level, the players are tied in, and they, I think the corporate side understood that this is a process that has to play itself out. But I guarantee it, it was impossible to get my guys deals, even smaller $5,000, $10,000 deals. I had a better chance of doing an appearance at a, at a, at a signing than, than, a, than a football player. They didn't want, you know, they, didn't, they, they were viewed upon as, you know, uh, greedy, and the fans really didn't want to participate. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, is interesting. The fans were mad at everybody. And the more that there are games not being played, the madder they get at everybody. And, and sides aren't even being taken anymore. It's like we were sick of the whole lot of you. I think fans have a, have a right. I mean, I don't, I don't know why the fans haven't, in different sports, haven't organized unions or something uh, and some collective agreement because, honestly, as a fan, I don't want to pay they have 90 they're, sick of the whole <laughs> <laughs> they're not very He's organized. He's an agitator, though. Sean. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'm sure that you folks have some questions as well. So uh, to request, put your hand up uh, high, I'll call on you, and speak clearly and loudly so that everybody can hear your question. I'll try to repeat as well. Are there any questions for the panel? Way in the back there. Yeah, our league and the NHL has the same thing. Is there, there's committees. Um, so there's the planning committee and the finance committee, and those committees are made up of owners, like a board of directors, so to speak. And they're the ones who are responsible for negotiating the deals and then bringing a negotiated deal back to the rest of the board of governors for a vote. So there's, there's a cross-section of, of owners that have been voted by their other owners to be part of those committees that are responsible for, for that in the NBA. I think it's probably the same. Same answer, um, but you know, the, there's owners that are more aggressive than others that, ha, have, that, that when they speak to the governor or the commissioner and uh, other owners of other other teams look to for guidance because of how long they've been owners. So uh, Ed Snyder's owned the team since 1957, so he's he's held in very high regard. And, uh, but uh, he was a full supporter of Gary through the whole process and. Um, Everyone has a say, but there's definitely boards, and you know, there is a little bit of strength in numbers. Right, and we saw that in the NFL. Robert Kraft was looked at, the owner of the Patriots, as one of the engines to get the deal done. So that, that became, uh, you know, he became somebody that we looked at at the end that was a little bit more of a facilitator. But, yeah, there are some that are more out there and some that, that were less. Other questions? Yes, front row. I think Gary's done a great job, and so is Peter Lugo and Ed Snyder. I mean, uh, he's, the, the league has grown um, in terms of the, the money generated. I think the year before we knocked out was the highest revenue the league's ever produced. TV ratings have grown. TV partnerships have grown. Um, he's had to make difficult decisions. When you sit in that seat, that's part of the job. Uh, I think Gary has gotten an unfair shake in a lot of perspectives respects with the public because, again, he he took the role of being the, the, when the clubs couldn't say things, owners couldn't say things, he was the voice. And he was the face of a, something. You're, it's kind of like being the, uh, you're in a position where you're setting yourself up to be, to catch a lot of heat. And that's kind of what the commissioners have to do. And again, they have big jobs, but in these roles, it's very tough to come off looking <laughs> anything except that it, it was getting critical. A second row right here, striped shirt. The, 
the trade rumor one I'll take first because I'll, I'll use Jeff Petrie's line. They're a king until they're not a king anymore. <laughs> like whenever the media asks him and the fans say the same thing, you know, the rumors are going to be out there and, and, and fans are passionate about certain players. And you really have to just try to steer them back to the team. You know, you try to stay away from, you know, one individual player. For us, you know, DeMarcus is obviously, from a talent standpoint, is, is tremendous. But we don't have, right now on our roster, the all-stars like we used to, like Chris Weber and Mike Bibby and Peja and Vlade. So for us, it is really more of a team thing. So we just try to stay focused on that discussion. Um, the fans in the relocation, you know, that's been going on for quite some time now. and. There's nothing that we could say right now that, that seems to, you know, appease them. Because, like I said, this is a breakup for them. This is a, a relationship, you know, whether it's a boyfriend or a girlfriend, it's, that's how they view this. They've had this relationship they've invested so much time in. Um, you know, so we, again, just try to, to keep them engaged with the entertainment that's going on and stay focused on the season we have at hand. You know, at the beginning of the year, we said, what we do know is that we're going to have a season here this year. So let's enjoy it. You know, we'll try to make your experience as best we can. Um, you know, and hopefully the team can perform for us. One thing to remember with trade rumors, I think it was George Carl, who's the coach of Denver, one time had a competition with some of his friends in coaching to see who could get the most outlandish lie published in around the trade rumor time. <clears throat> so when you start to read who's going to be traded for whom, understand there's a lot of disinformation out there. And this is coming from someone who's spoken to people in the business around the time. And you hear all sorts of stuff. And it, it, some of it can be flat out false. Some of it can just be a couple people talking over coffee. So be careful about the rumors. Uh, any other questions? Back right in the tie. You want to give that a shot? It's a completely different business model. It's like comparing apples and oranges. Um, it's, it's been a, it's, they've done a great job. Um, but with not having a cap and not having some of the, the regulations that are set in the other leagues, it can it, it's unfair to even try to compare. Well, I mean, I wouldn't. Uh if you were an Expos fan, I think you'd strongly disagree with that uh, comment. Um, they lost a whole year in baseball, didn't they? Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, I think uh, World, Series. World Series, and I was, you know, Yankees were, Don Mattingly was going to win a World Series that year, in my opinion. But uh, Major League Baseball is, uh, has a lot of steeped in tradition, and it's a little bit different, but, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it's had its problems just as much as any sport. I think without having, I think the, one of the biggest things, without having a salary cap, it changes the whole dynamic of how business is run. And, uh, and the guaranteed salaries from an from a NFL side, it's, uh, without a cap, I just think it just, it, it allows really the big markets to take over and uh, smaller markets, they'll, they'll do what they have to do to survive. Yeah, and, and, I, and the other thing is Major League Baseball had a lot of its problems back in the 70s and into the 80s when they were one of the first. Did they have the Players Union, Sean, do you, before you guys, before the Hockey League? I mean, I know Marvin Miller was agitating for the players back in the 60s and the 70s, so they went through a lot of growing pains previously. And, and as everybody has said, their model is so different. You don't sit down and say, how long are contracts going to be? They, the market determines what the contracts are going to be. Who, how, how, what's the salary cap? There is no salary cap. The Dodgers just signed a $250 million a year local TV deal. Think about that. They can have a, 200, a quarter of a billion dollar um, salary structure without selling a single ticket or taking in a dollar from the national TV uh, rights that Major League Baseball has. It's a completely different animal. Okay, another qu Did you have the question right there in white shirt? Go ahead. teams would they be? <laughs> Within this collective bargaining agreement, <clears throat> there are stipulations, regulations that address just that issue in terms of contract length, um, so-called backdiving
Another thing that goes in all of this is the economic climate at the time. We're not exactly in a boom time, so when you sit down and you're thinking, what's it going to be like in eight years, you tend to think of what it's going to be like today. You don't say, well, geez, we're going to be flush in eight years, so let's, let's go do all this. It's, let's be very, uh, right now, let's be very uh, sensible, and that kind of guides some of the uh, negotiations. Anyone else? Right there? You're talking about the partners, the broadcast partners of the leagues and the teams? Yeah, no, the negotiations were between the leagues and the players and, you know, the, the fallout, you know, impacts the TV stations and, and the media stations, you know, Sean actually has a station as well. Um, you know, I think as you're negotiating, you, you certainly think about your broadcast and media deals and how they impact the overall economics um, so you know what kinds of deals you can, can cut. But, you know, as far as positioning on the negotiation table, that, that doesn't really happen. The, the same thing, except that a lot of the TV contracts, especially locally now, uh, there's protection clauses for rights deals and whatnot. In, in a lock in lockout situation, um, they're not involved in the negotiations per se uh, with the players in the league, but they're definitely impacted. Like because of when our deal got settled, most of the national me local media buyers had all their fourth quarter or first quarter, excuse me, their all placed, so they lost a lot of potential advertising revenue. They had to go chase a lot of money. So a lot of the deals are, do a lot of the TV deals are making make goods and other forms of uh, make whole provisions to, to th keep the dollars. Anyone else? Right here, pink shirt. I don't think it really does plays into contract negotiations. I've never really talked too much, unless a team approaches me and says, "Well, he's had three or four concussions." And, but you know, teams are going to use anything against you. You know, 20, 27's too old. Okay, well, uh, he's only 26. You're wrong. Well, 26 is too old. We want him younger. So um, you know, player safety. They, it's it's inherent in the sport. I think. Uh, you know, football's a violent sport, and you take you consider the risks. And, and there's a lot of players that are willing to do almost anything to play an extra day, an extra week, an extra year. And um, you know, as an advisor, representative, you can only talk to them too much, so much about that. Um, but they accept the risks for the most part, and it's 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 sad to say, but they'll say I think they'll deal with it later. And that's why you see a lot of retired players. I don't think the NFL takes good care of their players at all. Um, you know, in hockey, the guys used to be able to wear no helmets. Crazy. You know, uh, th these sports are slowly you know, kind of dealing with some of these issues. Front row right here. I mean, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think it's a great point. It's a great question. Why does uh, Why does you have a college basketball player that has can come and play for one year, and then you have a college football player? I'm not saying a guy from Villanova necessarily, but you have the player from South Carolina who looks like he's a, a grown man, like he can bench press ten of us. And uh, this guy deserves to go out this year if he wants to. What if he tears up his knee? You know, he's looking at his teammate Marcus Latimer tear up his. You know, so I don't understand that. You know, and I think in the future. We've had conferences uh, about this in the past. I think there'll be a privatization of college sports. I think the NCAA is 
Uh, if you have the millionaires and the billionaires, I don't even know what the next word is, but the quadrillionaires, the NCAA is, has a racket going on right now. Um, and, you know, college athletes, in the old days, it used to, don't get me started on this, but college athletes, you, the education used to be worth it because in sports you'd make, you know, you'd make more money as a salesman than in playing pro sports. No longer is that the case. And college athletics makes a lot of money, and I think it's, uh, players are, should be, need to be compensated more than just a scholarship, especially since they have, could end their career in college. You know, if, 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 if you don't pay them in college, at least give them the option to go straight from high school. It might be a horrible decision, but at least they're, that's their choice. Uh, ever since I was in college, when you used an abacus instead of a computer, my dream was to organize and unionize uh, college athletes and stage a wildcat strike at the national championship game for a slice of the gate revenue. So don't get me started on that either. Uh, in the back, we had another question. Yeah, I, I think, you know, in the CBA, you know, there was compromise for everybody, but the one thing that, you know, from a league standpoint and a team standpoint, we wanted to try to, to make sure is that we had competitive balance. So there are rules within the collective bargaining agreement that, you know, make it onerous for teams to spend a lot of money, max contracts for three guys or four guys, because it's going to cost them double of what it otherwise would have because of the tax that they're going to have to pay for that. Um, and, you know, I don't know that the goal was to prevent the big threes or something like that, but it was definitely to try to get to competitive balance. And, you know, having players out there dictating kind of where they're going um, versus, you know, having the teams dictating it was a real tug of war. Um, so I think you'll definitely see less of it, and teams are going to have to manage several years out you know, so if you sign the guy for four years or five years, you're going to have to see what that impact's going to be for you in year three and, and figure out are you going to be able to sign anybody else because at one point some other guys are going to fall off. Um, so it, it really just makes you have to plan it better and stay on top of it. Um, I think we'll, we'll see if, you know, the big threes are done. And, you know, I think you're going to see more superstars changing teams more than they have in the past just because people are trying to manage the cap and, and that, that whole economic structure has changed from what it was in the past. Michelle, is Andrew here? Okay. Uh, for, I'd like to thank our panelists here before we get to Matt, uh, Sean and Ed and John uh, for their expertise and great questions from, from the audience. Uh, I really appreciated your uh, input also. Our next speaker is someone that everybody in this room should want to pay attention to because of what he does. Matt Crevin is the founder of The Voice of the Box, a career coaching business which focuses specifically on careers within the sports industry. He's going to speak to you about how to, what you should be doing in terms of preparing for a career in sports and getting ready to, to make your mark and impress some people with what you're able to do. Matt? Thank you, thank you. I've just uh, got a little bit of housekeeping that we're going to take care of here first. This is hot off the press, so anyone's got their devices, which I'm sure everyone does. Anyone that's tweeting, which I'm sure everyone is. VU Sports Conference. Put it out there. I've just been told, so just a messenger. Wouldn't we just say it's the wild, wild west? Absolutely. Social media. Absolutely. Let's, let's put it to work. So anyway, and it's got their uh, devices. Go ahead. It's VU Sports Conference. And uh, I've got a few other bits of housekeeping that I want to get to. And then uh, I'm going to get into some uh, content that hopefully people can walk away with and take some action on, more importantly. Um, I'd like to start with a little trivia contest, just real quick. So for those of you that have your devices, whatever they might be, get them out. I'm going to give you an email address so everyone's got a fair jump at it. And let me know, I'm just going to kind of give you a, just a second, I'm going to give you an email address, which is mine. It's Matt, M-A-T-T, -T, at Voice of the Box. I'm saying it slow. Matt, M-A-T-T, -T, at Voice of the Box, dot com. 
Nothing like a little Villanova sports trivia. I do this everywhere I go, and these questions are not mine, so uh, I'll give the appropriate thank yous uh, in a moment here. But again, well, I should do it now. Jonathan Kent, where are you? All right. Question number one. And by the way, these are uh, the first three that come in, and I'll, obviously they'll be time stamped on my phone. Got a little T-shirt to hand out for you. So the first question is, what year did Villanova drop their football program before resurrecting in 1985? That is question number one. I'm just going to go through this fairly quickly because we don't want to spend all night doing this. Second question. How many NCAA tournament appearances has Villanova had thus far for college basketball? I'm not sure if you guys are eligible, by the way. I'm just thinking. <laughs> you want to take a stab at it? Go ahead. Everyone got the first two. I'm going to move on to the third and last one of tonight's trivia question for a Voice of the Box t-shirt. I know it's pretty exciting, but hey, it's... One extra day of laundry, right? Who's a lovable trainer for the football and basketball team who served the Villanova community for over 50 years? Who's a lovable trainer for the football and basketball team who served the Villanova community for over 50 years? Those are your trivia questions for the night. Those too hard, you think? Or? No. If you don't know the last one, you should go train. All right, let's get on to some important stuff. We're about halfway through the program, so I wanted to, I think it's a good time to kind of do this. Um, anyone in this room interested in a career in sports, please stand up. I'm like, who wants to work the business side of sports? Please stand up. You guys see anyone that's sitting down? I'm just curious. It's okay if you don't, you don't have to be. I'm curious. That's pretty much everyone. Great, appreciate it. So that's pretty much everyone, and I think we're in the right spot. First, I want to thank Michelle and Autumn for coordinating my visit to Villanova University. I'm happy to be here at the Business of Sports Conference. Again, my name is Matt Crevin, and I'm the founder of Voice of the Box. I want to tell you a little bit about who I am and what Voice of the Box does and kind of how I got to where I am today, and then share a little bit uh, about the core, at what's uh, at the career coaching core. That's pretty much what I do in the essence of what Voice of the Box is. I started in the sports industry like many, like many of you will or already have, as an unpaid intern. I was lucky to get my start in 1991, the 1991-92 football season with the San Francisco 49ers. So just two years removed from a Super Bowl, a couple of years later they're going to win their fifth. Almost won another one just a few weeks ago. <clears throat> Damn, so close. But it happens. So that's how I started, unpaid intern in the public relations department. And that launched my career to where I am now. Now, 20 years later, still with the 49ers. But in 1993, at the end of that season, they said, good news, bad news. You're doing a great job. You're handling all these assignments that we've been giving you. The boss's daughter is graduating. We need to put your full-time role down to a part-time role. Nothing I could do is the proverbial catch-22. I was at my first career crossroads, literally two and a half years in. So kind of keep that story just to the side and it's gonna, I'm gonna come full circle back to it. But that's how I broke in. Now I've also 17 years in corporate America. I've been able to work with both FedEx and Microsoft. So I've got a corporate side as well that matched and I, I'm gonna share with you kind of how I matched those two parallel careers and how they intersected. But my, my mission is quite simple. And anyone that goes to my website will see it. It's to develop the next generation of sports industry insiders. The goal is pretty simple, to take people from where they are today to, and where do they want to be tomorrow. And that's the career search process. And with all due respect, it might be touched upon at most schools, universities, and often, oftentimes it's not. And I kind of bridge that gap. I want to tell you just a quick little story. The year was 1982. And uh, I know that my uh, panel here will reflect, hopefully, uh, our ages, hopefully not. I was on my parents' couch. I'm in the seventh grade, and I'm watching the NFC Championship game, the legendary Dallas Cowboys coming to San Francisco to play the upstart 49ers. And they had a quarterback that was pretty young, Joe Montana. And it was the start of what termed to be Montana Magic, pretty legendary career. And this is maybe 22 miles east of downtown San Francisco, a small little town called Orinda, California. I'm watching this game with pure amazement. For those of you that I know, it's a while back. Go ahead and uh, YouTube it. You'll, you'll be surprised. It was a classic, classic game. 
I would have never guessed in my wildest dreams, wildest dreams, that eight and a half years later, I'd be in the same locker room with Joe Montana, coordinating post-game interviews with him. What's my message? Well, there's a lot of hidden messages in that little story, but the opportunity, be prepared for it. You never know when it's going to happen. It might be with a, a media star. It might be with an athlete. It might be with just a, you know, a, a top-level executive. But someone whispered in my ear before I first went into that locker room, and Montana wasn't the only star in that locker room, but they said, listen, there's a lot of people that come around these guys, and they're in all of them right away. Put that in your back pocket. You belong here. We hired you for a reason. Don't pretend, but just carry yourself like they're your peer. They're your colleague. And that changed it. That changed a lot of things for me. So I wanted to share that just with you right off the bat because you're going to have those encounters. If you haven't already, it could be from all walks of life. Someone that you might just put you on your heels and say, wow, I'm not sure. Should I approach that person or how do I act around that person? Just be yourself, obviously, is rule number one. So that just wanted to kind of share that little brief little story uh, with you. Is anyone in the room uh, at this point of where you are now, and I'm not going to ask you what years you are uh, in the program or at school here, but have any challenges securing an informational interview, perhaps having challenges starting the networking process, or if you have already started the networking process, how do you effectively leverage it? Anyone have any issues with even knowing where to start to put a career search plan together? Just show a hand. So if anyone, anyone experiencing any of those types of challenges, don't be shy. Guess what? So have I. And probably so is everyone. I don't want to say I want to speak for all of you here. The point is, even with the esteemed panel, they're all experts in their field. I'd like to consider myself an expert in my field. But we don't start out as an expert. No one starts out as an expert. Everyone starts out from the ground floor. So if you just go into, these, uh, into the process of wanting to meet people, and whether it's a phone call, or whether it's an informational session you want to gather with someone, number one, please don't ask them for a job. Just ask them to share how they got to where they are. Build the relationship first. But if anyone has had any of those issues, it's completely normal. So I just wanted to let you know, everyone goes through it, and you're not alone. But because of that reason alone is why I started my business. Now, Voice of the Box started as a hobby just about four years ago. I was with the 49ers. I asked permission at the time. I said, I'd like to bring my video equipment. I want to do some interviews with people that have behind the scenes job in the NFL. It was not 49ers centric. It was just about the NFL. And for the, everyone in this room will probably get most of it. But I interviewed the people that were the chain gang, the ball boys, the grounds crew, the equipment crew, radio and TV announcers, radio and TV producers, the beat writers from the visiting teams, the marketing reps from the visiting teams, the public relations staff, anyone and everyone that had something to do with what brings the NFL to life that we all enjoy on Sundays or Monday nights, I wanted to just interview them and ask them, hey, tell me about your job. How'd you get it? What's it take to be successful at it? And put up a free website. I was doing it as a hobby. I'm still traveling the country with FedEx, my corporate job. It got a little more traction slowly and surely. And really, the breaking point for me was the amount of emails I kept getting saying, really cool interview with that woman from Gatorade or, interesting bit you did with the guy from Nike and everyone in between. And the emails kept coming through. Can you help me? Can you help me? And it just was the big light bulb moment. I said, it makes sense. I said, now is the time. At that point, at that point, I had 17 years of sports industry connections, knowledge, and experience. And at that point, I had 15 years of corporate background experience that were fresh, relevant ideas of how to go about a career search. I dropped I shouldn't say I dropped. I resigned my role. I kind of did drop it. I resigned my role with FedEx, which was a, a big leap of faith moment to walk away from a paycheck, to walk away from the benefits, to walk away from everything, to chase this a little bit. But I had to have a plan in place first before I could chase it. And we were talking earlier that uh, I'm the poster child for there is no timeline for happiness. I mean, I did this at that point. Again, a few years ago, I was 17 years out of college. Of course, I couldn't do what I do now if I didn't have the credibility and the qualifications, I should say, more importantly, that gives me the credibility to do this. So again, the message there is there's a lot of people that feel like they've got to get fast-tracked and they've got to get that plum job right away. And some of you will get it, some of you will not. But the majority is it takes some work to get there. But just don't stop. Don't stop the work. So I wanted to share with you kind of a little bit about how I started. And, and that was the vision of mine was to help the people that were behind me. Help, help, help them with their vision. 
I found it. I found it late, but I'm sure glad I found it. And now for me, it's a great way to package it out there. So over the years, you know, I've been able to interview multiple people on my, uh, you know, through the web show that I used to do. And now I host a weekly radio show and I, I do all of these things and I've been able to build these connections up to the point where I can draw from those as well. But before I jump into kind of at what's at the core of tonight's uh, talk, which is my 4P coaching model, which I'm hopeful will jumpstart each and every one of you in this room tonight to just do something, even if it's one small thing. I wanted to just ask a quick question. And uh, we'll just go show of hands this time. We don't need to stand up. But a show of hands, what do you think the most important word is in business? The most important word. Just give me a show of hands. There's, we're not here to pick on people. There's no right or wrong. I just want to get a feel for what do you think the most important word is in business? Anyone? Go ahead in the back. Trust, okay? I will start, I will start pointing at people. Go ahead. Okay? Go ahead. Good. Last one. Network. All really, really good. Now, in my personal humble opinion, I'd love to get your guys' take on this too. It's the same word, in my personal opinion, the most important word in business is also the most important word in sports, whether you're playing on the field or on the court, whatever the chosen sport is. Strategy. Nothing happens if there's no strategy in place. I don't care what it is. No profits are generated. No trust is earned. Whatever the other ones were, I'm sorry I'm forgetting them, but nothing can happen unless there is a strategy in place. Got pretty quiet on that one, didn't it? You're thinking. You're thinking about it. That's okay. All right. Here's some questions that came to me when I was in your position. Because again, all of us, we've all been in your chair. Each and every one of us have been in your chair. And over the years, the questions that came to me that helped me formulate my coaching model were, well, who are you, Matt? Who are you? You know, what do you stand for? What's the value that you're going to bring me? What's the value you're going to bring this organization? What's the value you're going to bring this company? You know, how do you plan to align your efforts to do what we're asking you to do? All fair, all legitimate questions. So when I thought about, you know, elevating my hobby website, Voice of the Box, to the full functioning, you know, career coaching business, I use that as kind of my pillar. So my 4P concept, and we don't have to take notes on this unless you, of course, you want to. I'd be happy to share this presentation with anyone over email. I'm happy to do that so you guys can just listen or take notes. up to you. But it goes in sequential order. And uh, conveniently enough, I came up with words that all start with the letter P, kind of catchy. First P, how do you position yourself? How do you plan on positioning yourself to the target market or to the target markets? if they're plural, because there might be a few that you're going to narrow down. How do you plan on positioning yourself to them? Now, this is both verbally and in writing. In this day and age, I know everything is almost done over email, almost exclusively. And uh, I work with people one-on-one -on -one all the time to use that, but also, I hate to say it, but go old school. And old school is communicating. It's articulating your message. It's eyeball to eyeball. There is no replacing that. And I'm hopeful that my panel will agree with me, but uh, the sports business is a people business. It's an overused term, but is it, it's just so true, in my, in my opinion. You've got to get those eyes. You've got to get the handshakes because nothing, you can't really progress. So how do you plan on positioning yourself? It's done in writing. A positioning statement is the first piece that I work with when I work with clients one-on-one. -on -one. And someone might say, well, isn't that just the cover letter? I said, yeah, it's, it's yesterday, it's today's cover letter. There's a, you know, I, put a switch to it, a turn the dial 10 to 15 degrees to come up with something that's a little different than just your basic cover letter. So again, that's the first P. How do you position yourself? Lots of ways to do that. But we've all heard the term, you've got that one chance to make that one first good impression. I'd say it's fairly true. You've, sometimes you're going to get more than one shot, but you want to put the best foot forward when you have the opportunity. Tonight's a perfect example. Anyone that's going to go across the room and have a chance to network and meet, meet these guys here tonight? or myself, someone says, hey, well, tell me what you're doing. What are your interests? This is, this is obviously an easy setting, but the point is when you get ready to have that positioning statement, you have to really be prepared to articulate it clearly and concisely and deliver it. Second P is promotion. I get a lot of eyes that start to roll back in the heads with promotion. Well, I don't have anything to promote yet. And I say, well, I beg to differ. I'll always find something with almost each and every one of you, or people that I work with, rather, but how do you plan on promoting yourself with professionalism, with integrity, with tact that a job search requires? 
And there's lots of ways to do that. And I'm not a big quote guy, but I do have a few that I'm going to kind of share tonight. One is, uh, anyone been to the Barnum and Bailey Circus? Quick little show of hands. Anyone heard of it? I'm dating myself with all this stuff, but that's all right. P.T. Barnum, the famous founder. And uh, this quote's actually rung true. It's all about how you go about it. And the quote, hopefully I won't butcher it, but it's something to the tune of, something terrible happens without promotion. Nothing. Now, of course, he's trying to get people onto the big top, get them in to buy tickets. But it's true if you sit and think about it. Something terrible happens without promotion. Nothing. Nothing's going to happen. It's all about how you go out and do it. And there's lots of ways and techniques to obviously drop down and dig deeper of how do you plan on promoting yourself? What are some ways? What are some methods that maybe you're not doing now that, that could help you? So again, position is the first P, promotion. The third P is package or packaging yourself. And this is where I have the biggest mind shift to people when I work with them. And uh, again, I'm big on show of hands to keep you guys awake here. Who's heard of the, or familiar rather, with the business term CMO? It's a business term. Anyone? Show of hands. Chief Marketing Officer. Anyone heard of that now? Should have a few knowledge. Okay. I ask people, listen, you are your own Chief Marketing Officer. No one is going to put out your brand and protect it any better than you. Be mindful of how you go out and do it, and especially in today's age. There was a great comment earlier about how social media is a wild card and how what people are putting on Facebook and, you know, in today's world is uh, good potential. I don't mean this to be a scare tactic, but it can potentially be fairly damaging to a job search. It's unbelievable what happens. It's your brand. Be careful with it, but also have fun with it. But how do you go out and put your brand out there? Now, that's a bit of a crude analogy, and I use this quite a bit, but I think it gets the message across. We all shop at markets to get our daily things, bread, deodorant, shampoo, whatever it is you got to go out and get, cereal. There's reasons why you get what you get off the shelf. Reasons from, well, it's endorsed by my favorite athlete, or it's on sale, it's always a good one, or hey, I grew up with this, my mom and or dad bought it. Whatever the reason is, there's some reason why you pick that off the shelf versus the 10 to 15 competing products. So if you can think about packaging yourself in a way that's going to get a hiring manager to take reason to buy you, also known as hiring you, there's ways to do that that can help differentiate yourself. Packaging your digital brand as well as your physical brand. And there's lots of ways to go and do that. So position, promotion, package, and or branding yourself. And the last P is partnerships. Who do you plan on partnering with to help get your message out there? There's a lot of people that sometimes they feel like they're a lone wolf and I can't ask for help. I'm not good at asking for help and I'm not really sure how to. Hopefully most people are going to be like me. Not everyone is going to be. But I'd say there's a fair, fair percentage of people in the sports business that will be willing if you can have a little persistence and have the determination and have the drive to get it done, they'll be willing to share information about how they got to where they are. But partnerships, who are you partnering with to help get out there? Let's take Villanova University as a classic example. The professors here, they're designed to help you. You've got your, you know, you're already your immediate inner circle, whatever your family's dynamic might be, boyfriend, girlfriend, pastor, rabbi, career coach, anyone. Who are you partnering with to help get your message out there? So that's kind of a, uh, I know that was a, a little high level overview of, the, of kind of the 4P concept, but it goes in that specific order good reason is you got to have the positioning statement ready first. You want to be able to promote it tactfully and you want to be able to get the branding ready and then who are you partnering with to help get your word out, help get your message out there. I also want to just throw a few other little nuggets out there that I, uh, I like to call my four C's of communication. And um, I, I can't tell you how I think this, it, it worked yesterday, it's going to work tomorrow and it's going to work years from now, even more so. Be clear. Be confident, be concise, and always have a call to action. If anyone in this room decides they're going to reach out to any one of our panel here tonight and want to email them or get them on the phone, I highly suggest you go with that model. You know why? These guys are busy. They've got a lot to do. Everyone's got a lot to do. Everyone's attention span is minuscule, as sad as that is. It's the truth. If you come ready, be clear, be concise, be confident, and have a call to action. And for anyone that's concerned or curious, rather, about, well, what's a call to action? If you get me on the phone or you, you want to send someone an email, 
what is it you're asking them? What is it you want from them? Do you want a 10 minute phone call? Do you want to meet him for a cup of coffee? Whatever it is, ask the question. What's the call to action? People, I, get, I can't tell you how many emails I get daily with people just blurting out about themselves and at the end there's nothing. I hate to say it, but it's kind of a delete. Not to be rude, but if, there's, if they're not asking me for anything at the end, they're more than, I'm gonna respond, I'm not that rude, but the point is have a call to action. What is it you want? from them. Be sure to ask it. Anyway, that's, uh, that's kind of at the key of, it's kind of a little addition to the 4P concept. And uh, I know this sounds like a shameless plug, but I want to go back to what kind of something about Voice of the Box just for a moment because it started as a career coaching business. That's what I truly love. I come and do this quite a bit. I travel around the country and speak at universities. Uh, some of them have sport management programs, some don't. But the message and the, and the concept is the same. I authored a book I host a weekly radio show, all with the same single purpose. Again, it's to help develop the next generation. So I know I asked you earlier, anyone wants to take a note on this, I highly encourage you. This is not endorsed by Villanova whatsoever. I'm just sharing it with you now. If anyone is into social media and you would like an additional resource, it doesn't cost you an absolute dime and there is no small print, but I would encourage you to check out Facebook. The Voice of the Box page is there. If you like that, there's all sorts of resources that I'm always putting out, links to articles, uh, interviews that are on my radio program. It's simply there. And if anyone likes Twitter, it's at Voice of the Box. Those are the two social media places that uh, I post you know, fairly regularly, bits of information that are geared specifically to college students and graduate students and young professionals that want to break in to the business of sports. So a few other little things that I wanted to just share with you that I always think are important. Um, it's time to start thinking right now about how you can focus and enhance your skill set. We all have value to bring, each and every person in this room. Sometimes it takes a little refining to get there to find out, well, what is the skill that I bring? But start the process of refining that. In today's market, you know, and this is a key point I was talking about uh, one of our panelists beforehand, and I hear this a lot, and I imagine these guys do as well. But uh, I was referring to my old boss at the 49ers who now works with Nike, and he said, Matt, do you have any idea how many resumes we get each day? People telling us how much they are so passionate about Nike or someone with the Penguins. I, oh, I'm so passionate about the Penguins. My dad was a season ticket holder and it's my favorite team and I've got such a deep passion for it. He said we delete those immediately. But the ones we look at are the people that say, you know what, I've got a passion for Nike and I'm looking to kind of match my passion of Nike with my technical aptitude of X, Y, and Z, would you be open to having a quick conversation or I'd love to talk with you more about it? The point here is it takes more in today's market than just having a baseline passion for sports. I hear that comment a lot, so I want to share that with you. It takes a little bit more than just your baseline passion. How do you plan on matching it? What's your technical aptitude that you're going to bring to the table? What's your skill set that you're going to match with your baseline passion? We all have a baseline passion. What are you going to do that's going to make it unique? How are you going to match it? So hope that message uh, kind of sticks out for you a little bit. Needless to say, I think another little bit that I always like to share is just continue the process of surrounding yourself with people you can learn from. They're out there. They're literally a click away, whether you're on LinkedIn, email, what have you. But continue to put the process of always looking to surround yourself with people that you can learn from. It could be a small lesson, a big lesson, it doesn't matter. It's all part of the process of learning. It's kind of like a, an old car salesman tactic. And maybe it is, maybe that's where I got it somewhere. I didn't sell cars, but I bought one before. Benefits always trump features. What does that mean exactly? Benefits always trump features. Remember, you need to give people the motivation to want to help you. And you need to share with them what's the benefit you're going to bring to them and their company or their organization. Benefits always trump features. So hope that hope that makes sense for you. Um, I mentioned branding and how important it is, especially in a career search, is no one's going to handle yourself, protect yourself, and brand yourself any better than you. People can help and get you on the right track, but no one can do it and execute it better than you. So for those of you that might be taking this the next step in taking it seriously. Here's a few other things to kind of keep in mind as you move forward in your career. For those of you that are going to want to commit the time, the energy, and the resource 
that it takes to properly network yourself and brand yourself. For those of you that are going to do that, the reward literally is around the corner. And, I, and it's, not a, it's not a misstatement. It's, your reward is there, but you have to put the time and energy and resource to that. Obviously, be familiar with your skill sets. Refine them. Get to the point where you can put together a very clear message. But the four steps that I think are going to happen is those, again, those that are really going to take that next step with this. Establish your value. Think about it. It's not, it doesn't happen overnight, but establish your value. And consistently deliver on that value. Not sometimes, not maybe. Consistently deliver on that value. As a result of those first two steps, you're going to establish trust. And I mentioned there was someone that said establish trust when I asked her earlier what's the biggest word in business and sports. It was a good one. But once you do those first two things, you'll establish trust. And then once the trust is established, everything else is negotiable. So I'm going to repeat it real quick. Establish your value. Consistently deliver on that value. As a result, you're going to earn the trust of people. And once you earn that trust, everything else is negotiable. I share with you that because I've learned it, and I've learned it sometimes the hard way. It's never easy, but it, it, takes, it takes a process, and it's all right. But if you can keep those things in mind, I think you will be, uh, you'll be happy that you did. I can't stand up here tonight and tell you, here's what you have to do, here's what you should do, here's what you need to do. I'm just going to ask you all, do a favor for yourself, if anything else. Just do one thing within the first 24 hours of right now, do one thing that is going to jumpstart your career search strategy. I don't, it doesn't matter if you're a freshman or a senior. Do one thing. What, well, here's some examples. Just get a LinkedIn profile if you don't already have one. If you have one and you haven't paid any attention to it and you haven't updated it, update it. If you want to start the process of crafting a positioning statement, which by the way is just a paragraph, maybe a sentence or two, point is I urge you to just take one action within the first 24 hours. If you put it off any further, it won't happen. We all know it. Do one thing. It's for yourself, but do one thing that can help you and help the process along. And that's, I always end with that because I think it's important. Uh, again, I mentioned earlier uh, the social media outlets. I mentioned earlier the email address. Anyone that wants to feel free to reach out to me directly at any point, I'd be happy to. Uh, this, again, is not endorsed through, through Villanova, but anyone that would like to learn more about the career coaching, this is not the right forum for me to do this. I will just make it very short and sweet. Everywhere I go, I always offer a really nice reduced package. And anyone that even wants to learn more about it, just simply email me with the subject line, Wildcats, and we can talk about it over email or phone call. Just want to make sure I made it as an option for you. Um, again, I want to thank uh, Michelle and Autumn for having me here. Again, my name is Matt Crevin, the founder of Voice of the Box, and I appreciate being part of the Villanova Business and Sports Conference. Thank you. You guys are doing great. Thanks for being such a great audience. We still have one more speaker left, and we're happy to have him here um, to talk about lockouts and his experience with it. Uh, we're happy to have Andrew Brandt, who's an ESPN sports business analyst, and he's also the director of the uh, Jeffrey S. Morad Center for Sports Law here at the Villanova School of Law. So if you could continue to give your attention to him, we'd really appreciate it. Um, and then following his presentation, we have networking set up over there where you'll get a chance to speak and interact with everybody. Hi guys. Uh, what I thought I'd do is, is give a quick background. I think uh, some of you know who I am, and uh, now that I'm a quote unquote employee of the university, I'll sort of tell you how I got here and then talk about the subject at hand, which is lockouts. Um, my background has sort of been, I'm sort of a poster child, I hope, for harmonious relations in sports. I've been on the agent side many years and on the team side many years, and now kind of independent with media and some teaching in academia. Uh, the background was basically as an agent coming out of um, 
Stanford, I tried to play pro tennis, but my opponents convinced me I better do something else with my life. I wasn't very good. Uh, so I started actually at a firm in DC called ProServe, started representing tennis players, which is an incredible experience because there I was able to sort of a, uh, combine what I love to do with a job. Uh, but, you know, the whole idea of representing athletes, for those of you who are, I know are interested in being agents, uh, as Ed would say, I'd sort of say step away. You know, uh, remember, you know, it's, um, it's different. And what you're trying to do is really be a service for an, a person who happens to be high profile, but it's hard work and a lot of it is recruiting. And w in the tennis side, you know, I was really recruiting like 13 year olds because that's when agents uh, sign up tennis players. So in other words, I was recruiting the parents and parents of tennis players are no peach. Uh, so anyway, I moved over, I looked down the hall, at a, I was with a big firm in Washington called ProServe, and I looked down the hall and there was a guy named David Falk who's representing Mike Jordan and Pat Ewing and Allen Iverson and Alonzo Mourning. I said, hey, I want to work for that guy. So I want to move from tennis over to team sports, football, basketball. And I was able to do that because there was a need. And because there was a need, I jumped in. Raise my hand, and that's sort of an advice for everyone. When you see a need, raise your hand, jump in as soon as you can. Because first in is always going to get it. And once you're first in, then you have to prove yourself and stay with it. So my experience was great as a young guy representing football and basketball players. Did that five years, and then I was negotiating a contract for a guy with the Minnesota Vikings. And the Vikings GM kind of looked at me after the negotiation and said, do you speak a Barcelonan? I said, is that Spanish? Uh, he said, yeah, it turned out it wasn't, but anyway. Uh, I said, yeah, you know, I took it in high school, what the hell, right? He asked me to be the first general manager of something called the Barcelona Dragons. I said, what's that? He said, we're gonna build teams overseas in NFL Europe, it's gonna be great, you're gonna love it, you're gonna spread football around the globe. I said, okay, do you have any jobs in this country? He said, no, we're gonna spread it out, you'll enjoy it. We're gonna hire what he called rock and roll GMs to spread the word. So I. I had no wife, kids, anything. I decided to do it. And uh, I had three months before opening day, no players, no coaches, no stadium, no staff, <laughs> moving to a country that didn't know what football was. Anyway, we got it done. Instant football team, hired coaches, players. You know, we brought 300 players down to Florida. We poked them, prodded, tested them, ran them, wonder licked them, combined them, picked them. I didn't know who to pick. I asked NFL people who to pick. They told me who to pick. Picked 80 players, had a week of training camp, cut to 40, told 40 guys, some of whom had Spanish heritage, they couldn't come to Spain. I had a bodyguard for that. That was scary. We go to Spain, the guy tells me, hey, we've sold 173 tickets to opening game. I said, well, how does the stadium hold? 40,000. I said, that's not very good. He said, no, in Spain they walk up. I said, that's a hell of a lot of walk up. So anyway, one of my big marketing ideas in terms of sports marketing, my only big marketing idea, I went to the general manager of football club Barcelona. They were playing the night before us. They had 110,000 people. I said, what do you guys do at halftime? He said, what do you mean? What do you do at halftime? What do you mean? What do you do at halftime? What do you mean? What do you do from the time they go in to the time they come out? He's like, I don't know, smoke cigarettes. I said, no, what do you do on the field? Mm hmm. I said, can we just get it and run around and have the announcer say, come see the Barcelona Dragons tomorrow night, Montjuic Stadium? Do we still smoke cigarettes? Said, yeah, sure. <laughs> so we went and did it, and we had this great experience. We ran around, and the announcer said, come see Barcelona. I hope he said that. <laughs> and then the next game is just a, a monsoon. You know, the next day is a monsoon. It's like the big game. And thankfully, 18,000 people walked through. Now, I probably handed out about 10,000 <laughs> tickets, but... We had 18,000, and I'll just tell this one quick experience there. I was most worried about the product. I mean, that's what everyone's involved in, trying to develop the product of a football team, not look like junior high school. We go out there first half, there's no score. We're looking a little squirrely, like, whoa. Second half, first drive, we hit the tight end, seam pattern, breaks three tackles, 70 yard touchdown, polite golf applause. I'm looking around, hmm. And then our kicker comes out, kicks the extra point. They go nuts. <laughs> they went absolutely nuts. So I said, okay, Dorothy, we're not in Kansas anymore. This is different. And they were, you know, they cheered at the wrong times. They did the wave the whole game long. They did the Olay song the whole game long. 
Uh, and I told our staff after that, after a couple games like that, forget it. You know, we're not selling football. We're not selling touchdowns or receivers, quarterbacks. We're selling three hours in America. That's the only way we're going to survive here. So we brought over hot dogs, hamburgers. I brought, I hired two Miami Dolphin cheerleaders to teach the women there how to dance like that, Las Chicas the Dragons. We had this um, frisbee dogs and marching bands. We made it a party. Anyway, two years of that, uh, they never understood it. You know, they never wanted to. They had a party. They don't want to, you know, they never understood football. Like, why do you have huddles? Why do you need to meet? Why do you meet so many times? I said, that's what we do in football. Stop meeting. I said, all right. So back to the uh, States, I went back into the agent business. I went back to a company in Boston called Bob Wolf Associates. Bob was a pioneer in the industry. He uh, died unexpectedly. He left it to his wife. She didn't want to run a sports firm. She sold to a group in Boston. They hired people to run the divisions. They brought me up there. My time there was dominated by a guy named Ricky Williams. I met him as a baseball player with the Batavia Phillies, a minor league baseball player playing between seasons at University of Texas. Developed a good relationship, became his agent as a professional baseball player. And then the run-up began with his experience as a top football player at Texas. And then he was going to come out as junior year. We signed the papers. We had it notarized. I was going to send him in, but I thought I'd check with him. He's a little different cat, as you know. Uh, and he said, no, I, I'm going to stay. And then, I, you know, as Ed knows, I just saw a million-dollar fee fall from the sky. Uh, so now he's going to stay another year. And every big agent's at his heels. I'm going down to Austin, Texas every two weeks just to protect the asset. And I finally, he wins the Heisman. We go crazy. Everything's great. And I sign him. And, we, and then I'm traveling with a rock star. We're going to the Emmys, the Oscars, the, you know, the American Music Awards. I'm going to Europe. I'm going to Japan. I'm going to Hawaii. And all of a sudden, I see these guys hanging around. I said, Rick, who are these guys? Well, they work for this guy, Master P. Who's Master P? He's a rapper. And then he says, Andrew, I want you to work.